Welcome to the second webinar in the Dental Fusion IT series. My name is Derek Watson and I'm your presenter. I'm a dentist with a keen interest in information technology and I hope to transmit some of that enthusiasm to you. So let's have a look at what we're going to cover in this second webinar. Having looked at word processing and email in part one, we're going to look at something that is underestimated by most people, which is the office scanner, and then go on to talk a, a, a small, a tiny bit about databases. Don't worry if this sounds technical, I'm going to keep this all very simple. This is the sort of scanner I'm talking about, and this is the one I have on my desk. It's a Hewlett Packard C309A. It is a scanner and a fax and a printer and a photocopier, so it's very versatile. And you can pick up this or something like it for about £100. So what are the considerations when you look at something like this? You always want to choose a supplier that you know is going to be around in a few years' time and that has a history of making whatever it is you're buying. This is a handy tip when buying any hardware or software. So let's apply it first to this purchase. Is it going to be capable of handling the volume of work that you need? How many pages a day will you scan? What scanning definition will you need? In a small business nowadays, that's hardly an issue because most scanners with a sheet feeder will handle the volume and you're not going to be scanning at more than two or 300 dots per inch and all scanners can do that now. This one takes four cartridges to print and an extra cartridge if you want to print photographs. So running costs are a consideration. It costs about £70 to buy all five cartridges. Does it do everything and does it do it well? As I said, I use this principally as a scanner but it's also a colour printer on those occasions when I need colour. I don't really use it as a, a photocopier, but it will do that, and in an emergency, I can use it to send or receive a fax. But of course, email and attachments have largely replaced fax these days. It also prints photos on special glossy paper, but I don't use that facility much. The scanner can connect directly to a computer with a USB cable, or it can connect to your network through a network cable, or it can connect to your Wi-Fi so you can print wirelessly and it has Bluetooth so I can print to it from my smartphone. And in an ideal world all of this would work without any problems but experience has taught me that a USB cable is the most reliable but it makes it more difficult to share the scanner between computers. A network connection makes it easier to share but falls over a lot more easily. Connecting through Wi-Fi is a bit complicated for most people and it is very susceptible to slow data transmission rates and reception problems. Because I don't have to share mine and I want it to be ultra reliable, I have set it up using a USB cable. One consideration is how big is it? It has to fit on your desk because you'll be using your computer's scan as I'll show you later. Here's a page I grabbed from Amazon today to show you the sort of thing you need to look for. Reviews are a good source of information, but notice that I'm looking at home printer scanners rather than office scanners. In summary, the two most important things you're looking for are a sheet feeder and the ability to scan and print both sides of the paper, or duplex as it's called. All printer scanners come with their own software, but quite frankly it's a bit of a nightmare, so I don't recommend that you rely on the bundled software, but instead buy something that's suitable for scanning and archiving. The reason you can do this is because scanners don't talk directly to your computer. They go through something called a scanner driver, which acts as a sort of translator. In this way, with the correct driver, any scanner can talk to any PC. That's why on every website you will find a big section devoted to downloading the latest drivers. The early scanner drivers were called Twain drivers, in case you're wondering what Twain stands for. It comes from Kipling's quotation, and never the Twain shall meet but it has become known as technology without an interesting name. You might say, why don't they standardize scanner commands and build in some support into Windows? And that's what they did. So there's now another load of drivers called WIA, which stands for Windows Image Acquisition. And the difference between the two is that usually one of them provides more functionality than the other. For example, if your scanner manufacturer provides a Twain driver, then it will probably support all of the scanner functions. If you use a WIA driver, then you may find that, for example, the scanner will work, but your sheet feeder is not supported. You can download drivers from the manufacturer's website, and it pays to keep them up to date. 
because Microsoft brings out a new version of Windows, all of the hardware manufacturers in the world then have to rewrite the drivers for everything they have ever made and distribute them free of charge, and they soon get fed up with doing this. So once your manufacturer stops updating the driver for your scanner, then you may find that it doesn't work on any new version of Windows. So, in summary, you don't have to install the bundled software, but you do, at a minimum, have to install a driver. You can install both Twain and WIA drivers and have a choice when you scan, but it's better to stick to the one that works best with your hardware. So, why have I spent so much time talking about drivers? Well, it's because once you've set up the scanner with a driver, then you can scan from any program. And here is the scanner select dialog from the excellent free graphics program Irfan View. And you can see that it's asking me whether I want to use the Twain driver, which is selected, or the WIA driver at the bottom, or another scanner, the HP Scanjet 8300. Now, I have told it I want to use the Twain driver. Actually, you only have to do that once, and it will stay set up. And now it's given me the options for scanning, and I've opted for a single image, and then to stop scanning. Before we go any further, I just want to say something quickly about file types. The data in computer files is structured in many different ways, and they all have a suffix that shows what type of data they are. For example, a file that ends in GIF is a picture, while a file that ends in .txt is likely to be a text file. Here are a few of the more common file extensions. You don't need to worry too much about this because your computer should recognize a file format even if it has got the wrong extension and use the right program to open it. But you do need to know which format to use if you're saving things. For example, JPEG is a compressed format which is good for family photos. GIF or GIF is also compressed but in a different way. So it's good for clip art or cartoons. PNG isn't compressed, but it is larger, so it takes up more space on your hard drive. And uh, remember, no one's going to thank you for saving all the family photos in a cartoon format. Now, wouldn't it be good if there was one file type that could store everything and could be opened by everyone, whatever computer they were using? Well, there is, and it's called PDF. There are lots of programs that can save files in the PDF format including OpenOffice. The PDF format was invented by Adobe and this is the page to download their free PDF reader. Don't forget to untick the box asking to install McAfee Security Scan Plus, which they try to sneak in at the same time. And don't forget also, links to all of these pages will be in the notes attached to the online version of this presentation. If we go back to Irfan View for a minute, you can see that it has an option to save the scan as a PDF file. But if you're going to be working with PDF files all the time, then I recommend that you buy Adobe's own product, Acrobat. This was taken off Amazon today, and for some reason the old version 10 is selling for more than the newer version 11. It will set you back the best part of £300, but as far as productivity software goes, this is about as good as it gets and future versions will be cheaper for you because they have a pretty good discounted upgrade program. With this you can scan and archive pretty much anything from paper documents right up to web pages. Hopefully now I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of the Acrobat I use which is version 9. What I'm going to do is uh, scan the color document and then demonstrate how we can recognize the text that's in that document. So let me open Adobe Acrobat and I'm going to go to create and then PDF from scanner and then color, color document. Now when scanning a black and white document 300 dots per inch is fine. When scanning a color document 200 dots per inch is okay because each dot contains more information, mainly the color information. Once you've scanned something you can bin it. If you keep it Make sure you write on it that it has been scanned so you don't waste time trying to work out in future if you need to scan it again. My only caution is that PDF, which stands for Portable Document Format, isn't optimized for scanning images. If you're scanning and storing images, then you should use an image scanning program and image formats. PDF is designed for general business documents that might have pictures in them as illustrations 
and it handles that type of document very well. Now you can't see anything happening on the screen but I can hear something happening next to me and uh, we should have something shortly and sure enough it's telling me the scan is complete, it's giving me the option to scan more sheets, more pages or to scan something which is going to treat as the reverse side of the sheet that I've just scanned. But For the time being I'm finished with that so we'll say OK and then the scanner sends the document back to the Adobe Acrobat and from there what we can do is we can either manipulate it or more frequently you're just going to save it. Now uh, you'll see that there's some text there and um, this is only this is an advertising letter so it's not likely that we're going to want to keep the text from it but just as an exercise I'll show you how uh, modern scanning programs like um, Acrobat can uh, can obtain the text from something which in many cases can save you a lot of retyping. So we're just going to go to document and then OCR op optical character recognition text recognition and then recognize text and by clicking on that it's asking me whether I want to do the current page which of course I do there's only a single um, a single page in this document and now you'll see that I can um, select the text as though it was in a word processor and if I press Control C to copy it and open uh, a notepad which is a uh, notepad plus plus which is just a text editor I can press Control V and paste the text in there and uh, so uh, repurpose that text if I needed to so there's no point um, saving that what we can do is we can we can save this. this is what you'll do is you'll be scanning you'll be saving as and we'll uh, save, let's say, on the desktop, and I'll call it untitled because we're not really worried about the title. That's uh, scanning and uh, optical character recognition, or just extracting the text. Um, there are very, very many documents are in uh, the PDF format, including a lot of manuals and things on the Department of Health website. So if we open one, for example, we've got here uh, the text of, let me just move it over to that screen, of HTML 105 and this uh, having everything uh, this conveniently set up means that it's uh, you're far more likely to refer to a document like this if you can get it on your screen in a couple of seconds and if I expand the index on the left hand side you'll see that you can jump to any page for example but supposing you wanted to find out uh, what the guidance is about vacuum autoclaves you can use your shortcut key control F type in vacuum and then press enter and it's going to, if I zoom in there, you'll see that it's highlighted the first instance of the word vacuum in the text and so you can read the context of that and uh, if you want to go to the next one, click on this button, go to the next and then the one after that, then the one after that and uh, so very quickly if you want to know, for example, what HTML 105 said about uh, vacuum type sterilizers, you could extract that information from that document very quickly. Now I did promise to cover databases. As you probably know uh, a database is simply a collection of information. Each set of information is called a record and each part of a record is called a field. Now you're not going to be involved in designing databases but almost everything you do relies on one. So I'm just going to recommend one database I think is useful and I think which everyone should know about. And this is the UK National Property Register at immobilize.com. Um, it's a database of property and you can store, uh, make, model, serial number and uh, pictures, identifiers of uh, basically everything you own. And you can update it with all of your property and it makes it extremely easy to report something that's stolen. But the best thing is if the police recover any stolen property, they'll check against this database to try and find the owner. Databases are useful, but uh, you're better off as an end user probably. Well, I hope this has been useful and convenient for you, and you'll watch the next webinar in the series, which will deal with getting answers to financial questions, such as whether you're making a profit or a loss employing someone or doing a certain type of work. Quite important, I think. My contact details are on the screen. You're very welcome to get in touch if you have any questions, suggestions or comments. Don't forget to mention our webinar program to your friends. And thanks for your time and attention.